Take your Bibles, open to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, we are nearing the end of this series of messages entitled Hope Starts Here. We, we have seen since Easter Sunday how hope began with the resurrection and hope remains in place because the resurrected Christ is the ascended Christ who is the coming Christ. And so today we, we near the end of this series of messages and a, a message today I've entitled Hope for One. It, it's a, a vision that God is giving our church for the next couple of years that's based in the text of this letter and, and really begins to manifest itself in this passage today. If you don't have your own copy of the scripture, I invite you on your way out to make your way to the welcome desk. We have a copy we want to give you. We, we believe the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to make us more like the Son of God. Uh, and we want you in the Word every day, not just in our time together, but every day so that you're hearing from the Lord and, and sensing His direction in life, learning how the Spirit speaks to each and every one of us individually so that as we come together corporately, we are more ready for His teaching and His leadership and His movement in us and through us. If you got one of those copies of the Scripture, I want you to open up to page 669, Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6 will be our brief text today. Now, after we are done, I'll invite you to respond, and, and some of you will come, and these encouragers will pray for you. But at the end of that invitation time, the, all of us are going to pray for a, a group of young men who are leaving us this week and going to spend the next eight weeks preparing and going to a really difficult place in the world. And so today, we're, we're going to have our minds fixed on the Lord, studying together, responding together, praying together. Several years ago, my mom proposed to our family that we all go on a vacation together. My brothers have five kids amongst them. Rachel and I have three, and she wanted all of us to go. And it was one of these vacations where you go and every meal is prepared for you. And, and you go and, and breakfast is ready, and you go to the dining room and get whatever you want. And, and you, you have activities throughout the day, and then you come back for lunch, and then you have activities, and then you come back for supper. And the best part is at supper, there, are, there is dessert. And you don't even have to eat your supper to get the dessert. It, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. And there's a, a variety of things to choose from. And, and so it was me and my two girls. Gabe was still pretty young. And Rachel said, I'll stay back with him. And, and you go with the girls. And so the girls were there with their cousins. And, and we were choosing every night, what was dessert going to be? And the first night, we discovered this glorious thing called molten lava cake. Amen. Yes, from the, the reaches over here. Is that you, Matt? Yes, yes. Molten lava cake. It comes out as this fluffy, dark disc of devil's food cake. And as you pierce the skin of that cake, this chocolate lava just flows from it as if it's manna coming from heaven right there on your plate. And you eat it and you wonder how in the world did it keep all of that in? And then you find out you can order another, as many as you want, every night. And so every night as the dessert menu would come, the cousins and I would look at one another. We knew there's no choice. It's molten lava cake every night because it would flow freely from within. There is a hope that is within us because of who Jesus is and what he is doing right now, praying for us in heaven, preparing for his return. There ought to be a hope that is so welling up in us that as people come to us, it ought to flow from us like that chocolate flowing from that cake, that, that there be so much hope in us and coming from us that people would wonder, how do you have that much? Where does that come from? So that, that we can then point people to Jesus and say, this isn't a hope in ourselves. This is a hope that is in Christ because of what he did to rescue us from the domain of darkness and transfer us into his kingdom. The hope that, that knows that even in our suffering, he can make good of that and we can know him better than we've ever known him before. And a hope that looks for that day when he is returning and he will make all bad things come untrue. That there is a hope that is within us that ought to be flowing from us such that as we gather every week, as we spend time every day in the word, that we, we ought to have such a hope within us that we can't keep it to ourselves. And that we continually look around for the people who are near us, who are far from him, because we want them to know the hope that we know. And it could be today that you would say, Brother David, I don't, I don't have the hope flowing like that. And today I, I would tell you that, that what Jesus would want is for you to get to know him so much better day after day after day. And that you would continually gather with his people week after week after week 
so that you would sense the goodness of Jesus and you would, you would catch a glimpse as we sing and as we study so that that hope would begin to overflow. As Paul has, has written to the Colossians, he, he spoke in that first chapter of the supremacy of Jesus. And, and he, he wanted them to know there's no other name under heaven that you need besides Jesus for your salvation and for your growth and for your hope. And then that second chapter, he looked with them at, at the sufficiency of our faith in Jesus and the truth that is in the scripture. Because they were surrounded by people who were trying to, to draw them away into this philosophy or to that idol or to this practice. And, and Paul said, Jesus is enough. He's always been enough. He always will be enough. And our faith in him is solid. So he looked at Jesus' supremacy and our faith's sufficiency. And then in chapter three, he turned the corner and said, now here is how you as believers grow in sanctification. You become more holy with Christ individually and with one another corporately because Jesus is supreme and our faith is sufficient. But now Paul turns his attention in chapter four to those who are outside, to those who are near to them, but who are far from God. That if Jesus is supreme, and he is, and if our faith is sufficient, and it is, then it ought to be that, that we want this hope to move from us to someone who is near us, but far from him. That, that this is the blueprint God is giving us as a church for the next couple of years, because it is the very ideal that he had for the Colossians, and for that matter, for everyone in the early church. The plans have not changed, and we get to live this out in the lake area over the next couple of years. First thing I, that I see Paul telling the Colossians and so telling us is in verse two, that Jesus gives us prayer as a foundational practice. Jesus gives us prayer as a foundational practice. Look what he says in verse two, devote yourselves to prayer, stay alert in it with thanksgiving. Devote yourselves to prayer. He doesn't tell them to pray when it's convenient. He doesn't tell them pray when you have time. He tells them that devotion to prayer has to be this foundational idea within the lives of the believer. You might say, well, what does devotion look like? Well, there may be nothing more tangible and more readily available to you than your phone. You are devoted to this, whether you realize it or not, because it could well be that you've checked it a couple of times already since I started preaching. Because you're wondering, what am I missing while I'm sitting here? It, it quite likely is that when you get stopped at a red light, you pull this out. You cannot fathom the thought of being bored when you're in line at the grocery store or, or when you are there watching TV with the laptop in your lap. You have your phone as well because there is a devotion to this device that you have developed whether you realize it or not. There is, it, particularly with our, our young people, what they call FOMO, the fear of missing out. And they are continually checking their Instagram and checking TikTok and checking Snapchat and keeping their streaks alive because they don't want to miss out. There is a devotion. Imagine what our, our lives would look like if rather than checking our phones, we were checking in with the Lord that frequently. That, that as we stopped at the stop sign, we, we would stop and pray for a moment until as we're waiting for the light to turn from red to green. That we were praying for the people who were beside us or, or we, we got maybe a note there on our dashboard of mission teams that are on the field or the one who is near you but who is far from God. That there was this desire to be as connected with Jesus as often as possible as we are to our phone. Paul said if Jesus is supreme, and he is, then we ought to devote ourselves to prayer because it's when we pray that we treat Jesus as if he's the king. Because when you pray, you recognize, you admit, I can't do this. Jesus, you have to do this. Jesus, I'm not worthy of praise. You're worthy of praise. And so Paul was calling the Colossians and calling us to a devotion in prayer. Some have said that prayer ought to be as important to us as oxygen is to our lungs. The first thing you did as a newborn was breathe. For nine months in the womb, you didn't breathe as you do now. In, in the fascinating way that God has woven the body, you, you exchanged oxygen and carbon dioxide through the placenta, but when you came out, it was time to breathe. And the doctors did whatever they had to do, whether that was a swat on the honey or, or simply a cleaning of the fluids, and you began to breathe because it's what you were designed to do. 
And what Paul was reminding the Colossians and us is this, we are made for prayer. It is as we pray and as we devote ourselves to prayer that we put ourselves in submission to Jesus. It's as we pray that we submit ourselves to one another because we're lifting up needs together. And as we pray, it is that we are remembering there are those who are near us who are far from Jesus and they need him desperately. Paul said, devote yourselves to prayer. It has to be this foundational idea. But then look what he says also in that second verse. Stay alert in it. I know, I know praying is hard. I, I know that as you pray, you, you begin to focus on Jesus, but then all of these spiritual monkeys begin to jump around in your brain. They distract you. They want to take you to what are we having for lunch? Or what am I going to do today? Or why, why is this happening in my life? And, and you're trying to focus on this thing, but all of these other things begin to come in. It is hard to stay alert. And so, one of the things that may help you is to pray out loud. I know when I'm praying in a group and we're often praying out loud, it is far easier to remain focused and alert because I'm praying out loud. They are praying out loud. We have a list of things through which we are, are praying and, and there is a focus that is there. But I wonder too, if, if Paul might've had in mind that night when Jesus was praying in the garden of Gethsemane and he asked his disciples to pray with him and and he went off to the side and, and prayed in anguish. And when he came back, what did he find his disciples doing? They were asleep. Isn't that what good friends do? They sleep when everybody else is struggling. No, they, they, he wanted them to stay awake. And yet the, the pressures of the moment or the fatigue of their three years of ministry or whatever it might have been, they slept. They weren't alert. They didn't have the same passion and anguish that Jesus did. And so Paul is telling us that there has to be this alertness. There has to be this awareness that everyone around you is a soul that is made in the image of God and a soul that God has designed to know him. That every person, as we gather together, every person that walks in this room every week is a person designed by God, valuable to this church family, dealing with his or her own struggles. So it is as we pray that we want to stay alert, focused on Jesus and aware of reality and not sleeping, not being drowsy or distracted by the world. So Paul says, if, if we're really going to have this as a foundation, then we have to be very intentional about our prayer life. There has to be that, that continual checking in, just as you're checking in with your phone, that, that you are even more checking in with the Lord daily, not just in a time in the morning or in the evening when you're reading your Bible. And you certainly want to do that, to allow the Word to come into you, and then those prayers to respond to Jesus, there is this back and forth conversation between you and the Lord. But that prayer becomes something you're doing on a regular basis as you're going about your day, as you're sitting in your home, as you are at work, as you're with others and as you're by yourself, that it becomes this repetitive pattern and behavior in your life. Staying alert because there's always something for which you can pray, always a place where God is at work and how you can join him. For years, I've, I've had a connection with you all as, as Trinity Baptist Church because my in-laws have been here. I've been on mission trips with the people of Trinity Baptist. My girls have been on trips with Trinity Baptist. And I've always been so thankful about the prayer foundation that is in this church. But over these last five months, as your pastor, to see the desire that people have to pray, that, that as we met on Wednesday nights for midweek here in the Central Venue, on a regular basis, people would say, when will we start our prayer groups back? They were thankful that we were able to share those Wednesday nights together this spring, but they could not wait to get back praying together. And so as you go out today on the, the welcome desk, there are some of these yellow sheets and they have listed the, many of those prayer groups, many that meet on Wednesdays and what time they meet and where they meet and how you can be involved. There has to be this foundational practice in our lives and some of the ways that you'll learn best how to pray is by praying with other people. Carpenters become good carpenters because they work with better carpenters. Athletes become good athletes because they have coaches and other athletes with whom they work. If you want to be a better prayer, pray with other people. Pray out loud. Even if it's a bit awkward or uncomfortable at first, you will begin to find an alertness and a power and a richness in interacting with Jesus you've never known before. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. There's sometimes you, you don't know what to pray. Sometimes you're so broken or frustrated 
you don't think you can pray, and yet there's always something for which you can be thankful. He said, Brother David, you don't know how bad things are in my life. You don't know what I've lost. You don't know what I've gone through. And you may well be right. But I can promise you this. If you will stop and consider that because of who Jesus is and because he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into his kingdom of light, because Jesus is in heaven praying for us always, because the Holy Spirit who is in us, who have been rescued and transferred and filled and sealed. The Holy Spirit is always praying for us. And even when you don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit is praying for you. That is something for which to be thankful. Jesus is always praying. The Holy Spirit is always praying. And you have a church family with whom you can pray. There is always something for which you can be thankful. And when you have that attitude of gratitude, it begins to humble you and inspire you so that the things of life are no longer quite as heavy as they used to be. Those things that used to distract you no longer have as much weight or influence, and your prayer life becomes the foundation of life. The second thing that, that Paul is showing us is that prayer not only has to be the foundation, but Jesus then moves us to pray for missions. That as we are praying, we are exalting Christ. As we are praying, we are asking his wisdom to flow in us and among us. As we are praying, we are aligning ourselves with him and, and with his heart. And as we spend time with Jesus, we become like him. In Matthew chapter 9, it says that Jesus, after having spent a great deal of time with his disciples, after showing them how to fish for men, that Jesus looked at the crowds and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd harassed and helpless. And he asked his disciples to go into the harvest field. That, that because his heart was for these people, he wanted their hearts to be for the people. And so Paul is saying, as we align ourselves with Jesus, as our church aligns itself with his supremacy and our faith sufficiency and our church's holiness, that we then start thinking about those who are outside of us. And those who are going to those people. Look in verse 3. At the same time, Paul says, pray also for us that God may open a door for us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ. Paul says, as you're praying for your local church, then pray for us as well. Paul wanted to speak the word every time God gave him opportunity. Look at the last phrase there in verse 3. For which I am in chain. Paul was in jail as he was writing this letter. I've had the opportunity through the years to minister to several men who have been incarcerated. We've exchanged letters quite some, quite, quite often. I've sent them information and encouragement. They've sent me information about their lives and how to pray. Almost every one of those through the years have asked me to pray that their, their probation hearing would go well, that their their lawyer would work harder, that they would have a better lawyer, that, that they would be more comfortable. There, there have been a lot of requests. None of those men in jail ever asked me, David, would you pray for me that I would share the gospel effectively? And here's Paul in jail saying, I would rather be courageous than comfortable. Paul said, I want you all, as you're praying for yourselves, pray that I would share the gospel, that God would open a door for us to share the gospel. Despite the fact that I'm in jail, I know God's at work. If you read his letter to the Philippians, which Paul wrote very, very near the time that he wrote the Colossians, Paul tells the Philippians that one of the jailers, one of the guards, actually had come to know Jesus, and he actually worked in Caesar's house. Paul knew that the gospel was not chained, even though he was. And so Paul said, as you are praying for yourselves, pray for me. That's why we pray for missionaries. Because we know that, that we have the opportunity to participate in their ministry, in their mission, as we're praying for them. It reminds us that, that ours is not the only mission field. Ours are not the only burdens. That we're praying for those who are going out and sharing the gospel wherever they are. You have the opportunity in praying to participate in that mission. Paul says, pray for us. Look what he says in verse four. So I may make it known as I should. Paul says, people have to know Jesus. And so would you pray that we would be courageous and that that would be more important than our comfort? When I was on staff at First Baptist Winsboro the first time when I was doing youth ministry there, our pastor was named Steve Cochran. 
We had some members of our church who were missionaries with our international mission board in Tanzania. And Cochran told me one week, he said, I'm going to take some guys from our church. We're going to go to Tanzania. We're going to work with the wards. We're going to show the Jesus film in Tanzania. I thought, man, this would be great. Can't wait. And Cochran took five of, of the, the strongest men in our church, five, five men with whom he was very close. I couldn't wait for him to get back. And sure enough, they came back after being gone about 10 days and told of the story. They would go from village to village and they would set up a projector screen and set up a projector and set up a generator and they would wait for nightfall. And while they were waiting, they would go through the village and, and meet some of the leaders and invite people to come out. And at night, after it got dark enough, they, they would turn on the generator and, and the projector and they would show this, this movie about the life of Jesus in the language of those people. And, and there would be dozens, if not hundreds, at the end who would come surrendering their lives to Jesus. It's an amazing story. The congregants said one night in particular, they were in one village and, and, and they could see certain things around the screen because the light as it was hitting the screen would bounce off. But he said just beyond where you could see visibly, they could tell that there was a man or maybe several who were, who were just beyond the crowd and, and just beyond visibility. And they weren't quite sure what was going on. But that night, showed the movie, people came forward to be saved. The they helped start a church and add to some of the churches that were already there. They packed up their equipment, went to their tents, went to sleep. And the next morning, they got up ready to, to pack everything into the trailer and to make their way to the next village. And as they went to the, the spot where they had shown the movie, they noticed what had been happening just out of eyesight. There were rocks strategically placed in a circle all the way around where the crowd had been and the projector screen had stood. One of the local pastors and the missionary that was there said, we know what happened. Last night, while we were watching the movie, the local witch doctor had come and had put these rocks and was casting a spell over you all, calling down the demons and, and those spiritual forces that were here, asking them to corrupt and disrupt what Jesus was trying to do here last night. Can you imagine? Being in a place that, that was so given over to those demonic forces that, that there was one who was there willingly asking those demonic forces to disrupt what was going on. Steve came back and was telling us that story. There was an older man in our church, his name was Cecil Haynes. Cecil was easily in his 70s, if not in his 80s at this point, stooped over because of age, retired, not able to do a whole lot physically. He said, Steve, when did that happen? What day was that? So Steve thought for a moment and, and told him what day it was. And Cecil said, I was praying for y'all at that exact moment. He said, I, I was here in Winsboro, Texas, but the Holy Spirit was stirring me so powerfully to get on my knees and pray for you all. And now I know why. Because while it was nine or 10 o'clock at night there, it, it was around noon in Winsboro. And Cecil said, I, I just stopped. And in that moment, I pled to Jesus for you. And in that moment, Cecil Haynes, a retired, physically weak man was as much a part of that mission trip to Tanzania as the men on the mission trip. Because he was praying for them that God would open up a door and they would share as they should. And that's why we pray for missionaries. We, we pray because in praying, we, we are aligning ourselves with Jesus and saying he is supreme. We are praying because we are aligning ourselves with one another, knowing that this faith in which we partner is sufficient. We're aligning ourselves because we want to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. And we pray because we want to participate. Even if we can't go, we can pray. Paul said to them, pray that I would be courageous and that that would be even more important than my comfort. And so we pray for these mission teams that go out in the summer. We, we pray for our, our churches in the Cary Baptist Association. We pray for our North American missionaries and our International Mission Board missionaries because in praying, it is this foundational practice that unites all of us in the mission, whether we are there or here. And thirdly, Paul tells the Colossians and he tells us that Jesus empowers us to influence our culture. Paul said, I, I want you all to pray. And he said, I want you to pray for me. But then he said, but I want you not only to pray, but I want you to speak. And so it is that, that Paul is showing us that we talk to God about people and then we go talk to people about God. Quite often, we're, we're not successful as we try to reach our one because we haven't surrendered that one to Jesus first. 
Oh, look what he says in verse 5. Act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. Paul was telling the Colossians, when you leave your gathering, act wisely toward those who are near you but far from God. You always are going to have the opportunity to represent Jesus, to speak like Jesus, to act like Jesus. Paul says, act wisely. Making the most of your time, it's a phrase that that can be literally translated, buy the time back. In other words, you realize that your time is so valuable that you give to it a value that is eternal. And you say, Jesus, help me interact with people in the, the line at the grocery store as I'm having my oil changed while I'm at work, when I'm at the park walking the dog. Help me act wisely. Help me buy back the time. Verse six, let your speech always be gracious. He didn't say if, it, it, this idea is you are going to have conversations with those who are near you who are far from God. And so he said, let your speech be gracious. In other words, let it be pleasing. Ask God to give you the wisdom to use words that, that will help give you an entryway into that person's life so, so that there is a comfort, a connection. And yeah, but then look what he says. They are seasoned with salt. He says, let, 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 let us speak so that we begin in a way that is comforting, but we continue in a way that is penetrating and purifying. Salt in that day would have kept meat from toxifying. It, it would have allowed them to preserve the meat so they could eat it at a later time. Salt gave flavor to food. And so just as a surgeon uses anesthetic, so you don't feel that knife as it goes in. So Paul says, let those words first be gracious, but then be penetrating. So that you create this warmth and this connection, but then you clearly are able to help them to see, here is the truth of Jesus. Here is the salt and light that will help preserve your lives. That will help purify your soul. That will help bring light into the darkness. And then look what he says in verse 6 at the end of verse six, so that you may know how you should answer each person. He said, you got to pray. You have to talk to God about people before you go talk to people about God because you want your words to have the warmth and the grace to open the conversation, but then the salt to be able to penetrate the death that is within them. You want to have wisdom so that that conversation goes as it should. And so Paul was asking them to pray for him so that he would be courageous and not as focused on his comfort, but then he's asking us to do the same thing. That as we live our lives, we're living so that we are courageous and not as focused on comfort. So that we are continually looking around us. This whole passage aligns itself with these three questions. How's your walk? Your walk is going to be built on this foundation of time with Jesus. Time in the Word. Time in prayer breathing out those things that are impure, and those things that need to be cleansed, breathing in those things that will help you know Jesus and align with him, that, that your walk as you spend time with Jesus is going to make you more effective as a church member and as a missionary throughout the Lake Erie. Then that second question, where's your work? That, that your work is going to include praying for other people praying for church members who are leaving on mission, praying for missionaries that you know who are near and far. But your work is also praying that you look around and speak courageously, wisely, with grace, salt, and wisdom so that you counter the cultural idols and you help them to see that Jesus is all they've ever needed. So Paul is is showing us that these three questions are built into this entire letter. And and they are the foundation of where we're going for the next couple of years. You may say, Brother David, if if I'm supposed to, every time I'm leaving the house, if I'm supposed to be on mission, that'd be exhausting. If every time I'm stopping, I'm supposed to be praying. And and every time I'm getting in a line, I'm, I'm supposed to be thinking about how I can be salt and light. I just don't think I can do it. Here's the good news. You can't. But Jesus can That's why Paul said it in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, God wanted the Gentiles to know the glorious wealth of the mystery, which is Christ in you. Paul Paul knew that the world needed to know Jesus. The lake area needs Jesus. And so he said in verse 28, we proclaim them, warning and teaching one another with all wisdom, that we gather together every week to remember we're not in this alone. 
that, that those around me who are here want the very same thing, the majesty and magnification of Jesus through our time together and our lives as we leave this place. But then Paul said in verse 29 of Colossians 1, I labor for this, struggling with all his energy which so powerfully works in me. And so what Paul would tell the Colossians, he would tell you, this isn't about you. This isn't about your strength. This is Jesus continually working in you. And the more you rely on Jesus, the more his strength will fill you and then pour out of you. And so just like that molten lava cake, when you open it up, that chocolate just pours out that we would become a people that if people began to dig in, all they would find is Jesus. And wouldn't it be amazing that as we walk out these doors every Sunday morning, it would be like peeling back the skin of that molten lava cake and we would be a people filled with hope pouring out onto the lake area. <clears throat> and if every single one of us were willing to share that hope with one person over the next couple of years, can you imagine what would happen to the life of our church because we have been so filled with Jesus and, and so encouraged by Jesus that all we are doing is pouring out Jesus as we leave this place. This was Paul's prayer for the Colossians. It is my prayer for us that, that we would have a time with Jesus and offer ourselves to one another and pray for those who are near us, who are far from God and expect God to bring revivals. This is what God can do. This is the hope. For one, in just a moment, we're going to pause. We're going to pray. And then I'm going to give you the opportunity to respond. Our encouragers will be down here. And, and it may be that you come down today and say, I've never met Jesus. I don't have this hope. I don't have this, this hope building up and flowing out of me. And today I need to know Jesus. The encouragers will be here and be happy to share with you how you can come to know him. Others of you might come and say, I, I need that kind of hope to stir up in me. I'm tired. I'm weary. And I know Jesus has something more for me. Would you pray for me? And the encouragers will do that. But then after our time of invitation for us to respond individually, then we're going to pray for that mission team that I had mentioned earlier. The cameras will be off and, and we will gather around them down here. So I don't want you to leave. As we respond, I want you, if you stay there to pray, if you come down here to pray, and then we'll pray over this team. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. Thank you that it fills us and it flows from us. Make us a church that has hope, a church that overflows with hope, a church that spills out into the lake area, eager to tell people about the hope we have in Jesus. Move in the room right now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.